that's actually uh, the words that are found in verse 37 of my translation. It says, astonished beyond measure. Verse 31, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Dec... Dec I have practiced that word all week, and I still can't get it right. It's, I know what it means in English. It means ten cities, Decapolis, uh, the sea of, to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought, they, notice they, then they, that's the people of Decapolis, brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech or a mute, and they begged him to put his hand on him. That's all they want. All they want is Jesus just to touch him like he's been doing everybody else. That's all they want is just for him to touch him. But Jesus, or Anne, Jesus took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. I kind of, I, I, I've been consumed by that spitting. I have think I've already shared this Wednesday night. I have thought of every song in the world. Do you realize we could have, I mean, I, I've made a whole list. There is power in the spit. Are you washed in his spit? Holy Spirit spit on me. He has anointed me with his spit. I mean, you can go on and on. But I am glad, well, I don't know. What do we sing about? Blood. Blood. I don't want just part of him. Blood is all of him. He didn't just cut his finger and squeeze some out on us. They pierced him and emptied him. Emptied him of his blood for us. Not just part of him, but all of him. So he spat and he touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha. That is, be open. Immediately his ears were open, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Astonished beyond measure. I began to think of some of the moments in my life where God uh, showed up in a way that astonished me uh, beyond measure. I hadn't been in Bailey's very long, and um, I'm driving through San Ignacio. It hadn't been very far from my house, and a woman comes running down the road, waving me down and stops. Now, I'm not there long enough to know what that means, so I stopped. Well, before I could think about it, she didn't run over to the driver's side where I had the window down. She runs, I mean, runs over to the passenger side, opens the door, and jumps in. And she's frantic, and she says, my little girl has swallowed a marble. We got to go now. Now, I don't know. I didn't have a, uh, I didn't have, I wasn't driving an ambulance. I didn't look like a Don Counts. Uh, I wasn't a first responder. I'm just a missionary, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do about a little girl who has swallowed a marble and that is choking? And so we're driving to her house. She's yelling, screaming orders. She's frantic. I'm frantic. All of a sudden, I'm praying to myself. I thought I was praying to myself, but then I realized I'm not praying to myself. I'm praying out loud. And I'm praying out loud, and I'm saying, Lord, I don't know what to do. What am I going to do, Lord? I don't know what to do. And I look over at the lady, and I realize I'm screaming as loud as she is out loud, praying out loud, and now she thinks she's in the car with a maniac who, who doesn't know what to do. And, but all of a sudden, she starts praying. We're both praying. Lord God, you take care of this. And we get, pull up, and she jumps out, and I start running up. The, there's, well, there's one of those houses up on the stilts. And running up the stairs, and when we get 
just about there. She had left her at home, left her little child at home with about a four or five year old sister. And that four or five year old sister opens up the door of that house. She heard us evidently running up the stairs. And when she does, the little child that was choking is standing right there just choking. And all of a sudden, that marble comes flying out her like a bullet down those stairways right at me, along with a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I'm going, oh, yeah, God. I, was, I could not believe what God did. And I'm thinking, God, you didn't need me. You just wanted me to be here for what you were going to do. Now, I was astonished beyond measure. I remember the first time Trish and I went and saw the Grand Canyon. You park way off here, you walk up there, and when you walk up, you look around and you go, oh my goodness, God. <laughs> I'm astonished beyond measure. It was the same way on, I think it was our 35th anniversary, when we took an Alaskan cruise. We're coming up through along the Alaskan coast, sitting on a balcony, and the whole thing, we're going, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. The whole trip, it was like, oh, God, you're good. You did better, God. That's better. And it was constantly astonished beyond measure. One of the times that I remember being astonished beyond measure was also in Belize. There was a, a couple that we had met, Daniel and Lydia de Paz. They had 21 living kids, all living in a, in a thatch hut that's smaller than that whole stage. And um, that 21 living kids. Now, they had had more kids. Not all of them lived or survived. Um, uh, Lind Lydia had become a Christian. They're not married. They've lived together forever. 21 living kids. They're not married. She becomes a Christian. She knew immediately, because in Belize, you could not get baptized if you were living in sin, of any kind of sin. You had to take care of it. If it was a public sin, you had to take care of it before you become baptized. A woman in Belize at that time had no value. There was no way. Without a man, you could not make a living. She has 21 living kids. She receives Christ. She tells Daniel, I'm moving out. I'm astonished beyond measure at the faith of a brand new believer who doesn't hesitate, doesn't question, doesn't rationalize, doesn't do anything other than knows exactly what she's supposed to do. She has suggested Jesus, she's going to follow. And I'm thinking, there is no way you're going to survive. And she did move out. A few weeks later, I was able to share Christ with Daniel, and this time Daniel received Christ. I did their wedding then I baptized them. Then we had the Lord's Supper. And they moved back in together. I was astonished beyond measure. Probably one of the saddest stories that I had that to my memory, and yet one of the moments that I still am astonished beyond measure was in the same village not too far from Lydia and Daniel's house, an elderly woman. Now, there's not many elderly Mayans, okay? They, they can live, when they get to 40, they look like they're 80. And I know some of you are listening, but it's true. <laughs> and so it's their life. Their life is hard. It's a hard life. There was a woman named Doña Juanita who started coming up to that Armenian Baptist church and I was there that first Sunday when she walked in that night everybody was surprised and never thought she would be there because they knew her husband but she sat towards the back some point in the service she gave her life to Jesus and you could immediately tell the change in her life after the service Juan Brasino, who was the pastor, came over to me and said, hey, do you have a Bible, an extra Spanish Bible? I said, yeah, I got one down in the car. So I ran down. That If you know anything about Armenia, it's built on top of a Mayan ruin, so it's on top of a mountain. So I ran down the mountain, got the car, and ran back up and gave the Bible to him, and he gave it to her. 
she took it home. That was the time, during the time when the men guarded their fields. They would go into the bush, into the jungle, and they would take their machetes and whatever else they could find, clear out about an acre, cut everything down in it, just flat and burn it, and poke holes in the ground and plant their maize or corn. And it was the time where at night when the corn was the most vulnerable, so the men would guard their fields from the animals at night. So he, he wasn't there when she had come to church. So sometime about midday, he travels in. He comes into their little small hut. He sees the Bible there. He knows exactly where she has been. He goes into a rage. He takes the Bible and just begins to tear it piece by piece, throwing it into her cook fire until the Bible is completely consumed. And then he took a stick, a club, and he beat her and beat her until her screams could be heard through that village. That night, we worshipped. Everybody in, in the thing had already been telling Juan and me what had happened to Doña Juanita. We're already singing. And I hear commotion behind me. I'm sitting up front, but I could hear whispering, and I turn to look down the aisle, and it's Doña Juanita walking in all bruised and battered. And she sits at the back, and we sing. And she sings with us. At the end of the service, she comes up, and she asks her pastor, Juan, Briseño for another Bible. Juan sends me down to the car and I get another Bible. I come back, I give it to Juan. Juan gives it to her. She takes it home. She puts it in the same place where she had put the other one the day before. About midday, her husband comes home again. He sees the Bible. He does the same thing he had did before. He tears it up, burns it in her cooking fire, and then he beats her, and her screams fill the village. That night, she walks in the church again. She wants another Bible. I give her another Bible. It goes on for weeks. At one point, I almost felt, well, I not almost, I felt like I was enabling someone for abuse. Juan came to me and he said, we need another Bible. I said, and she's standing there and I'm speaking my Spanish to Juan. And I said, Juan, you know, she doesn't have to have a Bible to be a follower of Christ. And she heard me. And I'm about to be astonished beyond measure. From a brand new Christian. She looks up at me with tears in her eyes and she says, the Bible's not for me. It's for my husband. She takes it home, puts it in the same place. He does the same thing. See, she loved her husband and wanted him to have what she had more than she cared about herself. Almost sounds like Christ, doesn't it? Doesn't sound like one of us, does it? No, and you're all thinking about what you would do or not do. Eventually, her husband did come to Christ. Though that was an amazing day, it didn't astonish me like the faith of a wife who would endure 
as close as she could to what Christ endured for someone she loved. Oh, I know what you're thinking. I know what you would do. This week, I stood here Wednesday night and wept before you. And I confess that I had trespassed. Because that Wednesday morning, in fact, all week last week, God had been speaking to me about, a, about a, someone that was living in a, in a truck in front of where I go every morning at 5.30. And I confess to you that I had trespassed because on Wednesday morning God told me to go talk to them. And I was just getting up the courage to get out of my car and go do so when our evangelist pulled in. That's where he was leaving his car. Pulled in. He came, opened up the door. He starts talking. And I said to myself, I'll do it later. And all day long, I realized I had trespassed against God. God had been very, very clear about what he wanted me to do and I had told him what I tell you not to do. I had told him later. Hoping that later would never come. Had lunch with Don Counts and our supper with Don Counts and Mary Jo Wednesday night. Evangelists are there and I had just asked Don if he had noticed all the the increase of homeless people in Fayetteville. And um, about that time his phone goes off. As a first responder, he gets a message. Someone has just stripped down naked and jumped off of the Elk River Bridge at Raging River Bridge, right by Hardy's. And I thought somebody had hit me with a sledgehammer. Immediately, I, I was certain that it was the man in the truck. And I stood up here and still thinking that Wednesday night, weeping before you, asking you to pray for me. And I ran from here Wednesday night, and I went to that parking lot. And I was, the windows were down, and I didn't see anybody in. And I'm thinking, that was probably him. But as I got all the way up, I see somebody laying there, and he looks up. And I look at him, and I tell him, I said, all day long, I was supposed to have the conversation with you that I'm going to have now. And I've sinned against my God by not having it this morning. You need to know something. I don't know who you are. I don't know your name. I don't know anything about your life. But I know that Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he burdened a stranger to come and talk to you tonight. One that hasn't been faithful during the day. But I'm here and I want you to know I love you. But he loves you more. There was no response. Very cold, natural. I woke him up. He's probably still thinking, what did he just say? I said, I'll be back in the morning. So I went back first thing Thursday morning. Had the same conversation. Stayed for about an hour and a half. They have not received Christ. I've found out since his name and I've been educated. Everybody's tried to educate me. His family has tried to educate me. Everybody's used the word, don't, whatever you do, don't enable. And I want you to hear me very, very carefully. I had this scripture on my heart. I know exactly where this scripture is going. You don't. Don't ever accept a rule or principle from the world to guide you as a Christian, ever. You see, my job and your job is always to do what? Do what God wants us to do. Period. Period. All of the other stuff doesn't matter. The question I need to ask and you need to ask every time we encounter, is this what God wants me to do and what should I do? What people do with it is up to them. I was unfaithful that morning. I don't want to enable anybody, but that's not my priority. I want to do what God wants me to do. 
And one day, from day to day, that may change. One day, I may do exactly what I'm supposed to do, and that may be saying absolutely no. And another day, I'm supposed to do exactly what I'm supposed to do, and, and on that day, it's yes. And some days, it goes way beyond a yes. Do you have any stories of where you were astonished beyond measure? The scripture is so packed full of truth. Uh, there's so much behind this scripture. Do you remember the Canaanite woman? That was the last time I preached about the dogs. And I, I shared with you that as far as I know, there are no Jewish believers in here, so we're all dogs. Every one of us are dogs. That we were, that the gospel was first to the Jews and second to us, and we're the second. We're the dogs. Before this scripture, Jesus has, has he had left Israel. He had left totally Israel. He had gotten away from all of its boundaries. He had gone way up to southern, to southern Lebanon. And there, there's one miracle that we know of. And it's that Canaanite woman, a, a woman who, who was cursed all the way back to right after the flood. And she finds grace. Then Jesus travels from there, and he goes 20 miles north of there. He even goes farther away from Israel. But no, none of the scriptures, all the scriptures tell us that he went up there, but, and he's up there for months, but we don't have a clue what happened. There's not a single story, word, or event about what took place in that area other than that he went there and he leaves there. Also a Gentile area. He leaves there. He comes all the way back down into Israel, but he goes over to Decapolis, which is on the other side of the Jordan, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is Gentile land. Ten cities that raise pigs. Oh, does that remind you of a place? This is the place where he had crossed to find the man that had over a, a legion of demons in him. He goes in, he casts out the legion of demons, and instead of the cities, those ten cities being astonished beyond measure, they're afraid. They're afraid. And in chapter 5 of Mark, just two chapters before this, the whole city, it says, and they, everyone comes out and tells him to leave. They don't want his miracles. They don't want the astonishment. They don't want Jesus. These, this Gentile area tells him to leave. And he leaves. For months maybe even a year. But you remember? Well, let's just in case go over to chapter 5, verse 17 of chapter 5. Then they, that is the people of that region, began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, I'm telling you something, that would have gone over really well, going into Jerusalem with a Gentile among your twelve. That would not have gone well. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has, this is, this is as important as what was done, how he has had compassion 
upon you. This is a Jew, Gentile. Jesus has traveled all the way across the Sea of Galilee for one Gentile man. And Jesus says, basically, the reason is because Jesus has had compassion on him. And Jesus departed and began, and, and the man departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And look, and all were astonished. All marveled. All were astonished. Now it's been months later. Jesus has left Israel. He's been up with Gentiles. He makes a trip back through and he comes to the same area. And this time, this time, it's very different. This time they're not running him out. This time, they're there with open arms. This time, they're welcoming. This time, instead of being afraid of one, they're bringing one. What's the change? What is the change? The change is what has happened, what God did in that one man who had the legions. That one man has done exactly what Jesus told him to do. He went everywhere preaching and telling about what Jesus did to him. But he, most of all, he shared how a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish Christ, shown compassion on him, a Gentile. And the people were in astonishment. I don't know whether they're in, in astonishment at what they see before them. I don't know whether they're in astonishment that it was all about a legion of demons. But could it be that they were astonished? That there was hope for them. You understand, we're that crowd. We're not. We read the gospel stories and we, th we think we're the Jews. This is one story that is, is about us. It's about us. There aren't many of the Jewish story of Jesus in the stories in the gospel that relate to who we are. We think, most of us think we just became Jewish Christians. We're not Jewish Christians. We're Gentiles who became Christians. We're heathens who became Christians. We're pagans who became Christians. We are the ones that Ephesians talk about who had no hope and no God. Because we had many gods, and none of them were gods. When was the last time you sat and really talked with someone who was so aware of their lostness, so aware of their sins, that they really didn't believe there was any hope? I bet for most of you, the answer would be never. Do you know what happens to you when you talk to someone that you are so very much aware that God is moving out towards them with compassion? But they can only see their ugliness. Everything in you works to try and help them to understand how loving the Lord is and that which he did for the Jews and that which he did for you he wants to do for them. And then finally, when it finally triggers that, that life that they've lived and all the stuff that they have done, that hasn't changed his love for them. And that finally dawns on them and, and they dare bow in 
faith and ask him to forgive them and cleanse them. When that salvation comes, it always flows with a giant river of weeping because they're astonished, overwhelmed. by the compassion and love that they have received, which they did not merit. But you see, when you're raised to be good and raised to be religious, your, sal your salvation no longer astonishes you. You see, this story is about an, a second chance. It is. For ten cities. Let that sink in. It's a second chance for ten cities. For a region that literally begged him to leave. They're now begging him to stay. And it makes you wonder if when Jesus knocked the dust off of his feet the first time, if he really meant to send a message that it was for all time. I don't think he meant it to be a message for all time or he wouldn't be back there now so how dare we when we knock the dust off of our feet and think that we are God eternal and that the knocking off the dust of our feet is for all time You see, those kind of decisions prevent you from knowing what God's will is for today. So what did Jesus do? As quickly as I can, let me share with you the path to astonishment that Jesus took or that they took, all right? It's very simple. I don't have any PowerPoints. I didn't want to have to do them. I didn't want to have to burden Belva either with them. So here they are. So what, what did they do? What is the path of astonishment? It's so simple. You don't need somebody to preach it. You can read it and see it. You bring a friend. Sometimes the path of astonishment for you is not because you come. Because you bring somebody else. They brought a friend. They, and that word plural they is used over and over again in this text. It's they that is astonished. It doesn't say anything about the man being astonished. I'm sure he was. But God wants us to know that it's those who brought him that are astonished. They brought a friend. Now for you to bring a friend, you've got to have a friend you care enough about. You've got to have a friend that you care enough about and you've got to believe enough in Jesus to bring them to Jesus. You got somebody like that. Maybe it's not a friend. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child. The path to astonishment is that you've got to move in his direction. But you don't come empty-handed. You bring somebody. I don't know what God is going to have me to do with that young man sitting in the Goodwill parking lot. I don't know what God wants me to do today or tomorrow. But I knew what he wanted me to do that day. He wanted me on that day to tell him that God loved him so much that he burned a stranger and told him to come and tell him that. What God does after that is up to God. God may never send me again. He may send somebody else. He may send one of you. But you don't come to God empty-handed. 
if he's done a work in your life that has brought astonishment to you, then you bring those who need a work from him to him. And that's more than just kneeling at the cross. Sometimes you have to take them in tow. You bring them. You bring a friend. You bring someone. You not only bring them, you come begging. Can you beg? That's the word that is used. They beg. They didn't ask. They beg. They got, do you understand this this time they understand what it means to beg beg means to get down in a helpless hopeless state and to get down as low as you can to hold out your hands as though you're wanting something and expecting something in other words you got to get desperate you don't just bring them and say hey preacher take care of them by the way you're not bringing them to preacher and it's not bringing them to church you're taking them to Jesus. And you beg Jesus. You beg Jesus. You lose all of your pride. You become extremely humble. You get down on your face and you beg. Because you realize you don't have anything that this person you brought really needs. You understand that? They don't have the ability to change this man's life. But they know the one who can. So they bring and they beg. There's several reasons why you beg. I'll give you two. You beg for a friend. By the way, there is no, remember this guy, he has a speech impediment. He never says a word. There's no recorded word from this guy before, before or after. No, no, no words. His friends do all the begging for him. That's important to remember. You beg for some because they can't. beg for some they don't know they should and therefore they won't you got someone like that find yourself begging for them because they don't know that they should the third thing is perhaps one of the most sacred and holy beautiful things that takes place here they release him into Jesus' care they bring him they beg and then they turn him over to Jesus and you know what Jesus did Jesus does this before but this is not Jesus' normal way Remember what they wanted? They just wanted Jesus to touch him. They, they were convinced. All you got to do is just touch him. Just touch him and, he, and he's healed. Instead, Andrew, can you stand? Jesus takes him. Jesus touches him and nothing happens. Jesus takes him and he takes him away from them. He moves him away to some private place. Most of the time when I hear somebody talk about their salvation, it's not unusual for me to hear about that private meeting they had with Jesus, even though they were in a room like this filled with people. At some point, Jesus takes them to himself, takes them away. Now, Jesus doesn't do this in all the miracles that, he, that we see. Many times, just the touch 
was enough. Or they touched him, and it was enough. But this time, Jesus seizes. The word take means to seize. He grabs hold, and he takes him away. This time, when Jesus takes someone away, is one of the most sacred moments. It's just you and him. A very sacred, private. That place that he takes you to becomes a holy, holy spot. Not because of you or anything that you desire, but because of his presence. It becomes holy. It becomes intimate. It becomes a bold moment. The word there where it says, and Jesus, let's see if I can find it. And Jesus put his fingers in his ears. Chill out, I'm not doing it. The Greek word is embalin, embalin. Put is mild. Embalin means to thrust. It's like Jesus comes up and he goes, boom! He thrusts his fingers in his ears. You ever been warned about Q-tips? Careful, don't go too far. I don't know how deep Jesus went, but he's not in there very long. He thrusts his fingers in the man's ear. And remember, the man's not blind. You understand that? This is not a blind man. This is a deaf and mute man. It's probably a good thing he's mute. He can't say a whole lot. Wait a second. Oh, wait. No, no, no. He's mute. He's not blind. When Jesus goes like, it happens so fast, and then pop. Then Jesus what? He spits. Now, this is not a Jew. This is a Gentile. But spitting is not good, especially if somebody's going to put it on your tongue. And Jesus spits, and then he sticks his finger, he emboldened, he thrusts his finger in the man's mouth. And everything about the man reveals that he is extremely compliant. This man must believe also that Jesus is able to do it. He's going to let Jesus do it, whatever. And I'm wondering if he's thinking, you know what, it's a good thing I wasn't a Jew because if I was a Jew, I would have been going right now saying, well, he never, he didn't do that. He didn't. I guess I'm a Gentile. I get special treatment. He treats them differently. He looks up to heaven. When Jesus takes you away, it's not only sacred, it's not only intimate, it's not only a bold moment, it's not only a surprising moment in what he does, but it's a heavenly moment. He connects at that moment when Jesus looks up, the Father and the Son are on the same page. Father and the Son are on the same page. And all of a sudden, you have your own Mount of Transfiguration. Only except this time, it's not going to be Jesus that's going to be transformed. You're about to be transformed. And then there's a word. I'd, I, um, I didn't write down the Greek word for it. It's kind of a strange word found in verse 34. After he looked up, look what does it say? He sighed. And when I looked it up and studied that word, it means exactly what you think it means. He heaved with heaviness. He heaved with heaviness. 
Something happens at that sigh. Jesus takes on something. A burden is transferred. It's more than just being here because of compassion. It's, no, it's more than just being here because this is the will of the Father. When he sighs, that heavy release of a burden is because he's been given a burden. He is taking, even before the cross, something this man has been carrying it now becomes Jesus and he's going to carry that all the way to the cross and one day he takes it on he receives it he feels the weight of it the heaviness that's been on him is now on him and he feels it and he sighs and now he's ready to speak open the ears aren't open from the fingers going, being thrust in and out the tongue's not open by the thrusting of a of spit and a finger onto a tongue it's not open when Jesus takes the heaviness it's open when Jesus declares it's finished. It's finished. You're open. And he goes back. But then the beauty of the whole message and everything else begins to take place. And Jesus tells them. Jesus doesn't tell him. That's different. Over and all the time with the Jews, he's telling the Jewish man, don't tell anyone. Don't tell. It's usually one individual. Don't tell one. Or it's in the house where there's, where there's Jarius and telling him and his wife, don't tell anyone. But this is, this is Gentiles. And this man is going to come back to the them that brought him. And he looks out to them and he says, don't tell anyone but they can't help it. They run out and do what they can't help and do, and it says the more he told them not to tell, the more they proclaimed until those ten cities are moved to a state of astonishment beyond measure. They should have been that way when, they, when he cast out the demons. But he touches a man who is deaf and mute, and the whole place goes crazy. And Jesus stays for a season. But you know what? The disciples didn't get it. Peter is going to have to have a sheet come down. He's going to have to have a dream and vision. Paul's going to have to have a Damascus Road experience. The disciples aren't going to get it. He takes them all the way up to southern Lebanon, then 20 miles farther, brings them all the way back down to 10 cities filled with Gentiles. He does an incredible act. It's not over. The next two Sundays are about what he does in this place in this place among Gentiles and they don't get it they don't get it I'll be honest with you it took me a long time to figure out to even get Doña Juanita I didn't get it until Willie. I didn't get it until Willie is all over town looking for something to kill me with. I 
I didn't get it until Willie showed up at my gate with something to kill me with. I didn't get it until I left Trish and the kids on the porch. And I walked all the way up to Willie, who was in a major state of rage and had been for weeks. With his machete in hand, lifted high. And I said, Willie, I love you, and Jesus loves you more. That made him even madder. But it brought him to a place where he could not swing. And his legs took him running as fast as he could away from me. And then Willie stole a horse. And broke his back right in two. And who did everybody come looking for? Me. And for months... years loved on a boy until Jesus changed him until Jesus astonished him and when Jesus astonished him Jesus astonished me tell you the same thing I told that man in the truck Wednesday night. Jesus loves you far more than anyone else on this earth. He is moved with compassion towards you. He does, what did it say? All things well. He wants to do some of those all things in your situation and in your life. You want to be astonished? And you're probably going to have to come bringing someone. You're going to have to get down on your knees and you're going to have to do some begging. And then you're going to have to get out of the way. And let Jesus have his private time with him or them. He doesn't call you and I to be the Holy Spirit. He doesn't call for you and I to come up with some principles to live by. He's very, very simple about what he asks of us to do. You seek my kingdom and my will every day and you ask for it every day that my will will be done I will tell you what it looks like each moment all you've got to do is be willing to do what I tell you to do even when it doesn't make any sense to you and even when the principles that you have created that have held you in a box and made God too small God says tomorrow will take care of itself but today this is what you're supposed to do don't wait until almost well, it was almost it was after 9:30 when God speaks starts speaking to you at 5:30 in the morning Don't make him wait until 9.30 at night. Astonished beyond measure. Praise him. Let's pray. Father, uh, you've taught me a lot this week. Some of it the hard way. I don't know what you want me to do even when I leave here other than seek you. Seek you. 
It is not my responsibility to, to discover your will. It is yours, O oh Father, to reveal it. My responsibility is to say yes when you reveal and not to make you wait. My call on my life and the call on each of us is to make sure that we say yes as soon as possible and don't make you wait. I thank you, Father, for second chances like you gave to this city. I thank you, Father, for the, for the grace you have shown to the Gentiles that you have shown to me. And the grace that you are wanting to show right now to some. Perhaps today, all this time for some is just you saying, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done. I've come back for another visit with you. I'm not far. I've come back when you have tried to send me away. But I'm back. I pray, Father, that the only one that probably heard the sigh besides the Father was the man. I pray, Father, that someone would hear your sigh as you take on their burden. As they take it off of themselves and put it on you, may they hear the sigh and may they feel and hear you say, it's open, set you free, it's done. You do it now. In Jesus' name we pray.